Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a great and incredible day planned for you today uh, in which we will be engaging in a number of critical discussions and breakout sessions addressing all facets uh, addressed by this incredible community of mental health. Uh, we're so fortunate, I believe, to be drawn together uh, this morning and last night by the incredible Patrick Kennedy. And uh, I think the power that Patrick has, has exerted to bring you all together is, is something that I know I feel very fortunate to be a part of. But more than that, we're fortunate to have with us so many distinguished physicians, researchers, policymakers, advocates who will be leading these sessions that you'll be a part of today. Uh, and I, and I know Patrick, am incredibly grateful uh, to everyone who has committed their time and expertise and efforts to making this conference possible. Uh, we'll be asking really all of you to be a part of this. And one of the things that we're asking you to do is to take some time during the day to do a brief interview uh, to create a permanent video journal of this event. So this interview that we're asking you to do should last no more than three, four, or five minutes and will be comprised of three brief questions and the, and, uh, and the interviewee wrapping up in each interview saying a catchphrase that, that we think uh, captures what this whole meeting is about. And that catchphrase is, the community of mental health, it's all of us. And you can say that with varying degrees of enthusiasm and emphasis or whatever appeals to you and, and works for you. Um, so now um, we will be having the, the day start with really an incredible panel uh, to look at, at where we've come in the last uh, 50 years, where we started uh, 50 years ago when President Kennedy uh, came out with uh, his incredible speech of February 5th, 1963, in which he talked about uh, the need for what became the Community Mental Health Act and additional legislation, and then what's happened over the last uh, 50 years, where we are and where we need to go. Because we don't, want to, we don't want this to be merely a celebration, this conference. We want this to be a launching pad for renewed effort to really try to achieve the vision and the goals that President Kennedy talked about uh, so convincingly and so amazingly 50 years ago. Uh, I think anybody walking down the streets of any major city understands that, that we have uh, of great distance to go in, in making the community mental health vision of President Kennedy reality. Uh, there's a lot of hope that was uh, launched and, and that, that has been inspired by President Kennedy's work and the work that so many people in this room have done over time but there's a tremendous uh, amount of work still to go. But the thing about today, as opposed to 50 years ago, is that we have a tremendous uh, opportunity as well. We have tools that we never had before. Research tools that I think some of you are aware of that will be talked about in our research panel uh, later on this morning. And advocacy and policy tools that, that Secretary Sebelius and Vice President Biden talked about last night and that many of the people in this room have, have, have worked to realize the Affordable Care Act, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So for all of the progress we've made, when we, we have a long way to go, but we have tools to advance uh, the community of mental health in a way that we never have done before. So it really is the time uh, to, to take action, the time to move forward, and the time to uh, move from awareness to fairness, as Patrick would say. Uh, from treating those with mental illness to treating them the same as any other people. So as you participate in today's conference, I hope you remember that now is not the time to pat ourselves on the back, however much we've managed to achieve over the last 50 years, but it's time to put the movement on our backs and carry it forward. So it's time for the uh, panel that we have uh, to talk about uh, the last 50 years to come up to the to the. Uh, to these wonderful, comfortable chairs uh, we have on the stage for them. And there's no better person to moderate this session on the place of the Community Mental Health Act in history than David Gergen, who has carved out a unique place as an observer and chronicler of public service and leadership in our country. David himself has served four presidents 
and today is Professor of Public Service and Director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. He also continues, as many of you know, as a regular political analyst on CNN. So please welcome David Gergen and the panel that is going to talk about the history of uh, the time that we've seen since the Community Mental Health Act. David, panelists. I'll sit way over here. That's all right. Is that good? Sure. Terrific. Oh, oh, good, good morning. It's good to see all of you here, and I know there are a lot of folks here a little hungover, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> but still cheering from last night. And we'll see. We'll see. 8-1 eight, eight, is not a bad start. The, uh, the, we have an opportunity this morning to really launch this wonderful forum in a very productive way because we have such talented people. Um, at the law school at Harvard, uh, one of the most famous quotes taught to students uh, is from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., the jurist, who once said that, famously said that, uh, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Uh, and we're here today to cover that page of history, to understand uh, where we've come since uh, from these past 50 years, what the vision was, how far we've come, how far we still have to go, where does the most recent uh, Affordable Care Act fit within that context? Uh, so where are we heading? And hopefully this will be a kickoff for other discussions that will come over the next two days. And if we might, I'm going to, you have, I think, some biographical material at your tables. So we'll be very, very brief on the bios, but as we call in each individual, I'll tell you just a bit about him. Um, and Dr. Howard Goldman is going to kick off. And uh, we're, he's going to give us eight to ten minutes of a, uh, an overview, which will be very valuable for getting all of us on the same page. And I must tell you, I know a lot of you are specialists. I come from a family with a lot of, it's made a lot of efforts in the mental health field. My oldest brother's a psychiatrist, and my next brother's a social psychologist, and my wife is a therapist. Uh, and my, our daughter is a, uh, is a family doctor at uh, the Boston Medical Center where she sees an awful lot of the underserved population. So I hear about these problems and, and issues and the agonies, <clears throat> but I don't, I, don't, I don't have a contextual framework, and that's what I'm looking for from Dr. Goldman uh, this morning. He has a joint MDP, MPH from Harvard. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of, of Maryland. He's authored, co-authored 275 publications. He writes faster than most of us can read. <laughs> uh, and, he, and he has a long and distinguished uh, uh, bio with, uh, and he has written a co-authored a book on the dilemma of federal mental health policy, radical reform or incremental change from 2006. So, Dr. Goldman. Thank you, David Gergen. And thank you to Patrick Kennedy and the forum <laughs> for convening this group. It was very nice last night to celebrate this event and Today we have an opportunity to see how it fits in the broader context of where we're going as a field. Uh, when I was invited to participate in this meeting, I volunteered to give these eight to ten minutes, and I hope that I can do the time allotted justice. It's a pretty complicated area, but there are a few themes that I would like to outline as I review some of the history. As I do that, I do want to acknowledge the uh, contribution over my entire career from my co-author, Jerry Grob, who's an emeritus professor of history at Rutgers, and I hope that many of you have read his books. When I was a resident, I read the first of his books, and we've collaborated over 35 years, <coughs> and I'm enriched by that experience as, as an amateur. There are several themes that I want to emerge from the story of uh, the history related to the 63 message and legislation. And that is the importance of the interplay between big ideas of fundamental reform as a vision and a direction for where we go as a field and the necessity of making changes that are actually incremental in nature. If we can put together a sequence of incremental changes chosen strategically, we can achieve a number of objectives. And there's been a history of presidential and national 
commissions that have provided the, the guidance for fundamental reform, but in fact we've been able to do our work through uh, incremental sequence of changes. I think about 1963, it really amazes me that it was less than 20 years following World War II. So to place it in context, we need to look backward as well as to think forward over the 50 years. World War II was a very big influence on this message in ways that may not be so apparent. From a military point of view in World War II, we discovered the tremendous prevalence and burden associated with developmental disability and mental illness because of the number of people who were declared unfit for the draft on the basis of those two conditions. When soldiers were inducted and then went to the front, many of them had acute stress reactions. And what psychiatrists and battalion surgeons like my father learned on the front lines was that one didn't need to evacuate casualties to hospitals in the rear as they did in World War I, but that you could treat people acutely by giving them rest and support and you could return them to the line. And when those physicians returned, they brought the ideas of acute treatment and early treatment outside of hospital settings back with them. <coughs> in civilian life during the war, the Coconut Grove Fire taught us about the importance of providing support to individuals following acute stress reactions. Eric Lindemann, here at the Massachusetts General Hospital, came to the Coconut Grove and tended to people in the emergency departments and used his ideas of early intervention to establish what was the first community mental health center in Wellesley, Massachusetts, the Human Relations Service. So there's a prior history leading up to 63 that's quite important. Uh, there was the creation of NIMH. Robert Felix was the first director, and he was very keen on these ideas of community psychiatry and prevention. He was a student of Lindemann and Gerald Kaplan. He insisted that not only the NIMH would be involved in research, but also in services and manpower development. During the Eisenhower administration, there was a joint commission on mental illness and health, and it dealt with both the issues that are small related to existing services, but also looking towards the future. And when the Kennedy administration began, an interagency task force was appointed, and it started to focus on these ideas of preventive psychiatry. So th this ferment of ideas led to this 1963 message and included both big, bold new ideas, this bold new idea of prevention and early intervention also existed in the law and in the message alongside smaller changes to uh, state schools for developmental disabilities, to state hospitals, and even to health insurance. If you look at the message, the idea of improving private health insurance coverage was included in the message and President Kennedy had actually directed the Civil Service Commission to have parity of coverage for federal employees during the, his own administration. So the seeds are sown for many of the very important ideas in this legislation that have played out over time since. So if we review the five decades quickly, you see again the interplay of these ideas of big picture reforms, after all, the Community Mental Health Center's program was a major infusion of federal money where state and local money had been before. It was a big idea. Prevention was a big idea. But this was not the first time that the field had confronted this very same idea. The moral treatment folks who advocated the asylum also said that early treatment of mental illness would reduce disability. And the mental hygienists of the turn of the 20th century said the same thing about the psychopathic hospital. But unfortunately, the treatment technologies didn't measure up to this very big objective. And so it remained to be seen what would happen with community mental health centers. And within 15 years of their launch, while they were very successful in promoting acute treatment, the field began to notice that there was a neglect of people who already had established mental illnesses. 
And so the field turned direction a bit away from acute care towards rehabilitation. And this was very important in the Mental Health Systems Act, which came out of President Carter's Presidential Commission on Mental Health. The focus on rehabilitation and support began to become preeminent. That Systems Act had two main products. I mean, the, the commission had two main products. One was the Systems Act in 1980, and the other was a national plan on chronic mental illness, which began to tinker with the Medicare and Medicaid program, which had come out in 1965, and turned out to be a very important set of resources available to people with mental illnesses and developmental disabilities. The national plan ended up holding the day as in incremental reform because the first thing that happened during the Reagan administration was the Budget Reconciliation Act, which repealed the Systems Act. And the lesson, I think, that's important for us here is to realize that there may be very big picture changes, fundamental changes in legislation and from commissions, but we need to attend to the incremental changes that can be made because even in the face of the repeal of this landmark legislation, the advocates had a blueprint in the national plan to go forward. The same thing, of course, happened with the Bush, uh, pres the Presidential New Freedom Commission. There were a number of uh, large things that were called for, changes in services and research, but there was also a call for parity. And what we saw emerge from that and the failed health reform were small pieces of legislation, small changes that have brought us to where we are today with the opportunity with parity inherent in the Affordable Care Act. We had 96 legislation. We had changes in Medicare and Medicaid. 2008, the federal parity law in both Medicare and private insurance. And then finally, the final step in this sequence related to health insurance is the Affordable Care Act, which has made dramatic changes in these, in, in these programs. So we don't know now whether our lot will be more successful with integration of mental health into the mainstream of programs or whether continued focus on specialized services and exceptional policies will hold the day. We don't know that for sure, but we do know that both are essential. We need a vision of where we're going to go, and we need strategic incrementalists to help us get there. And at least with the historical lens, I think the future is really quite bright. So I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say and to the questioning, and I think we're going to have quite an exciting day. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. You're <clears throat> <clears throat> Dr. Goldman, a, a, a remarkably a positive, optimistic uh, overview. Uh, others would say, wait a minute, uh, if, you, if you understood the prevalence of all these issues 70 years ago, how has it taken so long uh, to get to where we are? That's a very tough question. <laughs> I, I, I prefer to focus on the fact that on this long journey, we are in a far better place now than we were then. The political solutions have been a long in coming, but they have come by short, these short pieces. We needed to bring a public along. I mean, that, one of the points of the Surgeon General's report was to communicate from an authority, the Surgeon General, and in this case, Dr. David Satcher, the idea that this was an important public health problem. We've just had to do it a, a piece at a time to bring the public and politicians along. But I think that we've been quite successful structurally, but there's still much to be done. We, we need more resources, human resources. But it's been, it has been a slog. There's no question about it. Yeah, and <clears throat> your, your point about, I, I really was interested in your point about <clears throat> bold vision, incremental change. <clears throat> Do you think actually incremental change that slow but steady is, is actually wiser as a way? Or some people would say, why can't we have bold change? Well, we, we try it. It's necessary for the vision. It's, it's the way we do things here. And you just have to... I mean, my experience is that you just 
have to participate in that process. It, it's the reality that we're given. And we can be very strategic. I think the history of our evolution to this point is that we have been very clever and strategic. I, my metaphor is always hitchhiking. If you know where your destination is, you know which ride to accept and which ride to turn down in a strategic effort. But you're not sure you want to get in the car with every driver. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. You, you want to weigh that, that as well. But uh, there have been some very strange drivers who have gotten us to where we are today. <laughs> I, I, I was going to go to Steve, but Dr. Barton... As an old hitchhiker, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm willing to take risks. <laughs> We're glad you're still with us. Uh, Dr. Partis, you were, you were going to jump in. I was going to go to Steve. Please jump in. Well, uh, this is a complicated topic. I first want to say my thanks to Patrick for the great job he's done. Good. And the next thing I'll say is that um, I think I'd rather take a plane if I can get there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, the 1963 uh, Act was not an incremental change. It was a major change. And you've got to trace mental illness back centuries to realize what an inglorious history it's been and what kind of treatment and priority we've provided to the psychiatric ill patient. And the fact that that act called for centers brought into the main population communities, not in rural state hospitals, but rather where the public could see it, to try to attack one of the big problems and answer to your question, why does it take so long? The stigma on mental illness is as powerful as almost any other area of illness that you can think about. So there's tremendous obstacles. If you say to a given person, I'll give you a million dollars, what area of medical research would you put it in? I would bet you the majority will say heart disease, cancer, or Alzheimer's disease, or AIDS, but not mental illness. So mental illness has a tough road to hoe. And what happened was that launched a program of developing community mental health centers throughout the country each one taking responsibility for a couple hundred thousand people, 1,500 intended, and the program launched and was an interesting program going forward. <clears throat> After about half was done, some of the complaints that came about the community mental health centers was that they were not taking care of the most seriously ill. And the idea was if you took people out of the hospitals, and, and at, the, at the worst we had close to 600,000 people in state hospitals in this country in the early 60s. If you took them out, they had to have services somewhere. The community mental health centers should do it. And what happened was the community mental health centers were seen as not paying attention to the most seriously ill, but rather taking care of people who had less serious problems and not doing a good enough job. That led to the Carter uh, Commission, which then brought in the Mental Health Systems Act. That was intended to address care for underserved populations, minorities, children, elderly, people in, health, uh, in general health settings, etc. And amazingly, and it's perhaps not a statement about Washington, the act was passed after about two or three years of effort in October of 1980 with a big celebration in Northern Virginia. And about three to six months later, it was dead <clears throat> because the Reagan administration killed it and then block granted the money. So there's been a struggle here in terms of how are you going to prioritize, make sure psychiatrically ill people get care that's been going on for centuries. And when you ask why is it so slow, this is really a battle. So I think... There's not many things in life that aren't good news, bad news. The good news is, as Howard said, we made a lot of progress, but we've got a long way to go. Yeah, and to go back to that, 19, <clears throat> I can't remember, frankly. What, I remember going to block grants. I can't remember what the argument was for repeal. And the, and the, and the, when they, the, 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 the argument repeal. for the repeal? Yeah, what was I the was argument? the director of the National Institute of Mental Health at the time. Right. And I was told by my superiors in the government, keep your mouth shut about this, you have no voice in this. So when we went to testify to Congress, which we did annually, I was instructed, you say nothing about this. We made a decision. Who had you been appointed by? Pardon me? <coughs> had you been appointed by Carter? Or by I, Carter? I was appointed in the Carter administration and stayed over in the Reagan administration for about three years. And, and the, the issue was they wanted to get, uh, this was, I think, a reflection of the Reagan position of more authority to the states. Right, right, right. right. So was that rather than... It was new federalism. Yeah, I wouldn't, that, was, that was the argument. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was antagonistic. I would say... <clears throat> had we not done a repeal, had we not gone to block grants, would we have made a lot more progress? I think now? so. <clears throat> yes. I think you need national policy on mentally ill. You've got 50 states which don't think alike. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
I will say in, in favor of the states that it, the states have been an incubator of innovation. And uh, the, the, the Systems Act was attempting to be, to set the right balance between federal na national right. leadership and state innovation because the Community Mental Health Center's program that as launched in 63 was viewed as an end run around states that had antiquated ideas about mental health treatment. But they overplayed that hand and they eliminated a certain amount of innovation that was present at the states. So getting the right balance, but, but the budget reconciliation in 81 was really a, a bad thing for national leadership, for sure. Steve Adelman, <coughs> you've been waiting very patiently. As I think most of you know, he is a professor at the University of Delaware. He's former executive director of the Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation, has done an awful lot of work on developmental disabilities. And I, I wondered if you could help us, Steve, on this. <clears throat> about the public really isn't very clear, I think, about the differences between mental uh, illness and intellectual disability. First of all, can you state it, you know, in a way that everyone can hear, we're all on the same page. But more importantly, were you ever going to, were you ever going to be able to clarify what these, these differences are for the public, and is it important? Well, to answer the second question first, uh, I'm incredibly pessimistic that we'll ever be able to have the general public understand there's a difference between a person with an intellectual disability and a person with mental health issues. Uh, but intellectual disabilities start at birth and they are lifelong. The, one of the primary differences between what Howard said and, and the intellectual disability movement starting with the Kennedy administration is the role of families, that families of people with intellectual disabilities are involved throughout the lifespan of the person. Most people with intellectual disabilities live with their families. That's always been the case, but um, the deinstitutionalization movement he talked about has been similarly profound in the intellectual disability movement. But, and our entire system from the Kennedy administration on was built on supporting people and alternatives to institutions, yet most people still live with their families today. And we don't yet, have not yet figured out how do you support a 30-year-old with Down syndrome when their parents are 60 or 70 and make sure both of them have a decent life. <clears throat> and what are the most prevalent intellectual disabilities? Well, we used to call it, and if you look at the, the legislation coming out of the Kennedy administration, we called it mental retardation, uh, changed it a few years ago to intellectual disabilities because the people with that disability uh, thought it was a pejorative, and a young woman actually tugged on President Bush's sleeve at a meeting, and she had an intellectual disability, said, I don't like the term, and he issued an executive order, and then the American Association with Mental Retardation changed its name to the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And a couple of years later, Senator Mikulski introduced a bill called Rose's Law, which changed mental retardation to intellectual disability in federal law. So there's been a change in terminology. There's been an enormous change in practice. Most things are now community-centered. But um, I think probably the biggest difference between the systems for mental illness and the systems for intellectual disabilities. Um, most of the legislation coming out of the Kennedy administration was child-focused, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Most of the training was funneled through maternal and child health, yet most people with intellectual disabilities today are adults, and there's not a sort of a parallel track. There's not a parallel organization in DD that's equivalent to SAMHSA. There's an administration on intellectual developmental disabilities, but it funds three different programs at the state level. It doesn't fund infrastructure and sort of basic development. But the people with intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, are covered mostly by Medicaid? As adults, they're covered mostly by Medicaid. Um, and, you know, the, the difference is you've got an intellectual base coming out of SAMHSA and NIMH. Medicaid's an insurance program. And so while we've been successful starting in 1980 of getting people out of institutions, the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, sort of trending forward to Olmstead, we still don't have sort of an intellectual base in the federal government that's tied to funding. And Medicaid's done a great job of moving policy forward, but it's an insurance company. So, and in, in the, I'm, I'm sorry that I know so little about this, but the, when the Kennedy bill was passed in 63, how did it deal with the questions was that what were then called mental retardation? You know, there was a mental health, the Mental Retardation Facilities Construction Act, and it built 
university-affiliated facilities. That's what they were called at the time. Uh, today they're called University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And they were designed to bring training, service, and research at major research universities to students. I was one of those students of all kinds in two dozen disciplines. Up until that time, uh, except for a senator from Rhode Island whose name escapes me, uh, there had been no training about mental retardation sponsored by the federal government. So, so the population of people within the uh, developmental disabilities, is that group largely covered for, for health insurance, for medical coverage, and medical treatment outside the Affordable Care Act? Have, have that, has that population been ad adequately addressed, or is, are there a lot of problems with it? Um, it's been addressed through Medicaid for adults, but I've got there's lots of data on especially a crisis in dental care. There's not one federally funded training program in the country that trains physicians and dentists to work with adults with developmental disabilities. It's all child-focused. Yet, as I said, most people are adults. Um, most adults with developmental disabilities, 40% in one study report being lonely is sort of their biggest disability. The Affordable Care Act does some wonderful things around pre-existing conditions um, for the people in the individual insurance market and families have been trapped for a long time, can't move, can't change a job because their child has an intellectual disability, needs certain services, they change the job, that intellectual disability, the, ser the health services are not covered. So I, I predict a pretty big sea change once they fix this website stuff. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, I, let me tell. Let me turn to Joe Shapiro, who is a, a former colleague. We've worked closely together, and have been really impressed with his career. He's now at NPR as an investigative reporter, a, a real star there. But he he also, as many of you know, wrote a book <coughs> called No Pity: People with Disabilities Forging a New Civil Rights Movement. Um, and it's widely read in disability classes. Joe, so as you hear this, help us sketch out then what does the civil rights how does the civil rights movement idea apply to this wide gamut we've been talking about today? Um, when we talk about the Community Mental Health Act, uh, the, the idea that, that we want to treat people in the community, that, that's the, the core of the disability civil rights movement. And I think back to, uh, I, in, in, my, in No Pity, I wrote about uh, uh, a man named Ed Roberts. You know, in, the, in the fall of 1962, uh, uh, James Meredith is um, escorted to class, uh, integrates the University of Mississippi, escorted by federal marshals, and he opens up this uh, expansion of, of education for African Americans. That, at the, that exact semester, a man named Ed Roberts, who's a post-polio quadriplegic, starts at the University of California at Berkeley. And in the same way that James Meredith uh, starts this uh, opens things up for African Americans on college campuses. Ed Roberts uh, then tries to figure out a way that he can be successful and that uh, as uh, in his wheelchair at, at Berkeley and, and uh, creates programs, uh, lots of other uh, post-polio quad quadriplegics, other people with disabilities come to Berkeley and, and, and a disability movement starts there, same time, 1962. And the whole idea was how do we... Um, uh, work that we can uh, have a role in the community. At the time, there were just sort of two acceptable roles for people with disabilities. They were to be pitied or they were to be objects of inspiration. But it was the people with disabilities themselves and their family members who were changing the way the world looked at them. They said, we're not patients. We, we don't want to, we're not sick. We're not dying. We, we, don't, we want to live like everyone else. And that meant living outside of a medical institution or out of a nursing home. It meant having the, uh, the opportunities to go work, to, to, uh, to go to school. And they said, don't define us solely by our disabilities. Don't define us by what we can't do. Look at what we can do. Uh, it's not easy to live with a disability, but we can't change that. And the change needs to come from society. And sometimes it would be a physical barrier, a building with no steps, so you couldn't get in if you, if you had, were in a wheelchair. Other times it was attitudinal barriers, a, an employer who wouldn't hire somebody with a psychiatric disability. So they were saying that the biggest challenges they faced uh, weren't always the health challenges, it was those barriers that existed in society. And the Community Mental Health Act was sort of cutting edge in this way. It, it, was, saying, um, it was saying, look, we need to do these things uh, to get people in the community, and it also put an emphasis on education. 
you know, p people with uh, disabilities were not educated at that time. There's no, uh, the people with disabilities were the last group to be guaranteed a public education, not until 1975. And so this act, 1963, said that we need to put money uh, out so that we can train teachers of special education. Uh, a, a, a right to public education may have been meaningless in 1963 if there are no teachers uh, uh, to teach people with disabilities. So we had an infusion of, of uh, money to create a special education system. By 1975, we then have a, a law that guarantees there are a million children with disabilities who got no education at all. Uh, they start getting educated in 1975. It's interesting. The um, amount of time between the, the, uh, what we could now know as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 1975 and the larger sweeping uh, civil rights law for disabled people, the Americans with Disabilities Act, from 1975 to 1990, is approximately the same amount of time from Brown versus Board of Education to the Civil Rights Act. Uh, there's, there's this period, you educate people first, uh, they get rights to education, they get more educated, and then they go out, outside of the uh, school system and they want some of those same rights, they have the higher expectations and you get uh, larger civil rights. Uh, do, do you in your mind separate out the community of people with disabilities from the people we talk about when we talk about mental illness, mental health? I, it, it's the, I, th I see it as the same thing and that was part of the strength of the passage of the ADA was that you had all these uh, various disability groups coming together. Often they fought each other because they, they were fighting for different parts of the same yeah. funding pie, but um, the ADA was a, a, a place where, they, where everyone came together and, uh, and fought yeah. successfully yeah. for this legislation. So I, I see them together. That's probably it. You know, I think one of the important things to focus on in both of these areas is the extraordinary role of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And there were areas of the country which took on the problems of DD and made a big change and led to national attention. Mm -hmm. I think in the 80s, uh, the mental health uh, movement experienced the same thing with NAMI becoming a major organization. The Mental Health Association had been there but added on the NARSAD. There were citizens activated to try to do something. And I think that's what's going to be necessary because, yes, we're better, but we've come, we, we've, we've come a long way. We got a long way. I will tell you, my first experience with psychiatric illness was as a college student going to a state hospital to see a naked man in a room with nothing else in it except feces smeared all over the wall. That was psychiatric treatment way back. We're going to have a tremendous number of people come on who will be entitled and should get psychiatric treatment by virtue of the ACA. We've got to take a look at how we're going to provide the facilities, the programs, and particularly the manpower to address that. And that's going to need the help of all the people in this room and all other rooms around the country who care about this good. problem. Very good. That's good. <clears throat> I, I think your statement is going to help to advance the conversations over the course of the whole, uh, the whole forum. Uh, can, can I just ask about the politics of this for a moment? Because it, it strikes me in hearing some of this uh, that the developmental disabilities enjoys more bipartisan support. The Disabilities Act was actually passed under a Republican administration, under George H.W. Bush. Um, whereas mental health has been wrapped up and sort of health policy and should, in, should there be national health insurance and has gotten caught up in the Republicans opposing that as a general proposition would like to keep it very decentralized and the like. And so that one has more bipartisan support than the other. Am I wrong and right about that? Is that a generalization that fits? <clears throat> I think the important advances in federal legislation related to parity have been bipartisan. You do? Yes. And, it, you know, it was... Including George everybody. W. Bush signed the law in 2008, the federal parity law. It was, um, but the ACA, it had broad co-sponsorship. But the ACA had no Republican votes. But it was the, uh, the parity law of 2008 that set the table for the ACA making behavioral health an essential service, right. an essential benefit with parity. Mm -hmm. So there has been a certain degree of bipartisanship in this effort. You know, it was a George W. Bush's New Freedom Commission that pressed for parity that was realized during that administration. It uh, was I, Pete Domenici in, 90, in 96 yeah, Pete who, been very strong who partnered with Paul <coughs> Wellstone right. 
to give us the 96 federal parity law. It is true that health care reform in the Clinton administration failed, but out of that failure, which did include a consideration of alcohol, drug abuse, and mental health services, that came the 96 parity law. So there has been a higher degree of bipartisanship with respect to the coverage of behavioral health conditions than in health insurance reform more broadly. Yeah. I, I just want to say, I, I tend to agree with Howard that this is less a question of is this partisan or is this a connection to economic policy. We need investments in these areas. As we're sitting here, facilities for the mentally ill are being closed around the country. One hospital out in California closes its inpatient unit. Another hospital out in uh, New England, same thing. Down in Alabama, same thing. Facilities being closed. That's okay if you provide the community mental health facilities to pick up that care. That's what's not happening. And like it or not, it's going to cost some money. We have to also do something within the field to make ourselves more efficient and more able and bring in more providers to take care of it. But there's also going to be a money question. I think much of the argument is often about that, not necessarily antipathy by Republicans towards psychiatrically ill people. Can, can one of you help us understand <clears throat> the size of the populations we're now talking about who would be considered part of the, <clears throat> the DD community versus the people who are going to be coming in under ACA uh, for health insurance who have mentally ill or who are considered having mental problems? Well, one of my favorite stories about the Surgeon General's report, we did a focus group, and one of the things we discovered was that the general public believes that one in five individuals has a mental disorder, but they don't believe that 20% do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our rule of thumb. <laughs> Well, they, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I had to be very professorial. Well, well, and there's, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a, a poll that was taken in France asking, do you believe in God? And, and more than half the people said, no, we don't believe in God. Then they asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? More than half did. <laughs> <clears throat> I, was in, I was in China and gave a speech which was translated. I said that about 19% of the American people had psychiatric illness. It was mistranslated, 95% of the people. <laughs> and the, China, the audience broke up and laughed this uh, feeling. They always knew that was the case. 5% <laughs> were lying. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> so tell us, so what is, the, what, 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 give us some sense of the dimensions uh, of what we're dealing with. 60 million people, <laughs> uh, allegedly, 20%, 60 million people of the country have psychiatric illness. And one of the things that's most disturbing and most troubling and most challenging is the fact that a large number of those families and people do not want to come out and identify themselves and help, whether it's help politically, <laughs> uh, policy-wise, or even flat out with philanthropy to help. You can get philanthropy <laughs> for cancer, and you can get philanthropy for heart disease. Right. It's not so easy to get philanthropy for mental health. Right. Gates Foundation hasn't taken this on, for example. It's been much, it's been much more interested in international help. But what is the biggest foundation that deals with this? The biggest foundation that deals <laughs> the biggest with biggest foundation or the biggest philanthropy? Well, I don't know the biggest. Help. One of them that uh, I know well is NARSAD, which supplies money for um, for psychiatric research. The MacArthur Foundation had been involved. But if you, we took a look at once at the four thousand or so, whatever number of foundations there are in the country. And the percentage of people who mentioned mental health as something they'd be interested in was a pittance. It was less than 1%. Wow. And for developmental disabilities, the number would be a fraction of that. <clears throat> but, so, but so when you talk about a civil rights movement, Joe, you're really talking about 20% of the country. I'm talking about what? You're talking about 20% of the country. Yes. <clears throat> and, and it's, not, it's not fully and adequately addressed. It, 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 it's, it's a large percentage, and plus you're talking about family members. And, and again, this is... Uh, uh, Irv Zola, who was the uh, a sociologist at Brandeis, used to say that dis uh, disability is the one minority group that we can all uh, uh, join at any time. We're all just one banana peel away from joining the ranks of disabled people. So this, and so it, and it, this is one reason why there is this bipartisan support f uh, for these laws because it 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 can happen to, in any family. It's not a it's not limited by by any social. Demographic factor. Okay, now, let me let me ask you this question: Under ACA, hmm. when people go to sign up for the exchanges, given all the problems with the rollout, hmm. how are these folks expected to sign up 
online. And they, are they mentally equipped to do that? Do they, are the navigators going to provide enough help? Or is this, are we seriously addressing the people who need the insurance the most, maybe the ones the least able in many cases to sign up easily? I don't think that's restricted to the mentally ill. A lot of people yeah. who are indigent, a lot of people who may not be informed, uh, we have a program up in New York Presbyterian in which we're using navigators to yeah. help guide the people in terms of managing their own ca- health care, navigating and negotiating with an impossibly complicated health care system to begin with, to deal with. You need those people to translate. You need to help educate them with regard to their own health, which is also a critical part of do, this. Do we have anywhere near enough navigators? I mean, let's no. say they fix, fix the technical side of the system, which presumably they will when we're still alive. But when, uh, it, 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 even, even if it's fixed, are these folks going to be able to take advantage of it? Well, one thing, I, I, I think it's important to say that the one in five figure is an annual prevalence, and it covers a wide array of conditions. Most mm. of the people included in that number vary from year to year and certainly don't, won't have any unusual difficulty in in signing up for the Affordable Care Act. Not people with, we don't have one in five people with such profound impairment that they can't function. In fact, what's remarkable is how well people who have mental disorders Mm -hmm. really do function in spite of the symptoms and uh, problems that they have. Do you think we have enough navigators up there? No. I I don't really know, but I suspect we don't have sufficient. I'm probably going to need one to help me help my son sign up for the Affordable Care Act. I, I think there's no ambiguity about this. There are not enough navigators in this country, and it varies from place to place. So there are institutions or states where they've done more or less. That's one of the issues about not having a national policy. For people who are psychiatrically ill to try to figure out our health care system, normal people can't figure it out. So how the hell are the psychiatrically ill people going to figure it out? We, that's a function we need, and the navigation is not only important in psychiatric illness, it's important in other areas as well. I think that the point of my remarks, Herb, was really to remind us that that all of us are at risk during the course of the year to become a service user. It's a very common problem, and it's for most people, it's also a treatable set of problems. That most of us only have the average difficulty of negotiating a complex website, not a special difficulty. <clears throat> Joe is an investigative reporter. Uh, what, do, what does your nose and your investigations tell us? No, I, I've, I've looked at some of the... Um, I, I did a series looking at... Uh, at this. What we've created... There's a new civil right to get uh, uh, government-funded long-term <clears throat> care services in your own home. Uh, Steve mentioned the Olmstead decision as... Uh, by the Supreme Court uh, uh, comes out of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uses civil rights language to say people uh, have a um, right to get uh, long-term care in, in the least restrictive environment. And uh, uh, and states and the federal government have been slow, though, to I- enact this. So, so, again, this is very much the spirit of the Community Mental Health Act, getting services to people uh, in their own homes. But, but where you live, the, probably the best predictor for people with developmental disabilities of your life opportunities is your zip code. Right. Because if you live in Texas, you have a chance of being institutionalized because they spend 60, 70 percent of their budget for people with developmental disabilities on state institutions. If you live in Maryland, where I live, there's only one left. There are not many people there. And you've got a good chance of living in your own place and having control of the public resources that go for your support. And I assume that the Maryland is much more of the model, right? Much more. Much is, more is there any other state which is really at the forefront that you could point to? Oh, I, I won't offend people in the audience, but we've always looked at the New England states. We've always looked at Michigan, Oregon, uh, though Oregon's had some setbacks lately. Uh, states go up and down and up and down. The, the bipartisan nature of support for developmental disabilities is a positive thing, but sometimes it's bipartisan support uh, and an unholy alliance between Democrats and organized labor to keep people institutionalized. And we still have over 100,000 people in institutions in the United States and well, people who would be our friends. <laughs> well, AFSME has been one of the biggest opponents, both for people with psychiatric illness uh, and people with developmental disabilities, to getting Quite people the... out of institutions because those are state jobs. And you close the institution, people lose their state jobs. So 
a natural ally around health reform, asked me, all of a sudden around deinstitutionalization and community supports, not so helpful, not so friendly. SEIU a little bit better, but they've taken some steps backwards as well. You know, I, I, I don't think you can escape the fact that this is a complicated and bad news, good news story. So as Howard pointed out, there have been some marvelous things done. The recovery movement and a focus on what people can do, getting people back into mm -hmm. life, terrific. We've done a lot of stuff. But even when you get a law passed, you've got to, you've got to go detail, micro detail, to make sure that the people who should observe that law, observe that law. We've made tremendous movement toward parity. Is that complete? Is it actually realistic? And on a day-by-day -day basis, does it happen? I don't think so. I think we've got all kinds of game players on the other side of this I, uh, who'd be very happy to resist I, it. I, I, there's no question, and I'm sure all of us have had the experience, that there is big vision, there are major laws passed, and the execution of those laws is really hard. It's much harder than people think. Right. And, it's, and there are a lot of mistakes made and just curly cues you hadn't expected and exceptions and that sort of thing. Um, it, it, uh, I, I, Steve, I want to come back to you on this question. Of, there's been a... <clears throat> the number of people signed up for disability in the country has been rising rapidly over the last three or four years. And there is now a growing suspicion that there's game playing going on and a lot of fraud going on. And I'm wondering, and I'm worried that that may be a setback over time, people saying, well, these people are, don't really deserve it or they shouldn't do it or so forth. How, where are we on that question? Boy, it's one of the things that causes me to lose sleep at night because it's being painted with a broad brush. <laughs> And even our colleagues at NPR have sort of trashed supplemental security income and uh, SSDI. But you know, people with you can't fake having a developmental disability. I, I mean, I suppose you could, but that's a real population. People with lifelong conditions, well documented. Uh, you can't fake schizophrenia. Uh, it's just not going to happen unless you're a profoundly good actor. Um, but as the unemployment rate has gone up and people have been laid off, people who had conditions that were disabling all of a sudden can't find another job get on the SSI rolls, and uh, I think I'd be, um, I have to mention Eunice Kennedy Shriver, because this happened in the early 90s, the president's sister, and it happened with SSI, and somewhere in the audience is Marty Ford from the ARC, who's really the national expert on this, but uh, they were kicking children with mental retardation at the time off of SSI, a decision uh, that was later <coughs> reversed by a Supreme Court case called Zebley, and she, Marty, informed her of this issue. She picks up the phone, um, and she calls the White House, and uh, she's in to see Franklin Reigns the next day and in to see Mr. Clinton two days later. Um, you know, her passion and commitment to these issues can't be understated. When you have somebody that prominent and that driven um, who is able to pick up the phone and call presidents and get an audience, uh, I'm not sure there's a person with that equivalent um, sort of combination of things. Maybe Patrick will rise to that. I'm hopeful. And, and, so and you I, want to defend NPR? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't think you weren't referring to me. No, I want to make that clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, and Steve, I, and I'm glad that you did mention Eunice Kennedy Shriver because we, we wouldn't be here today uh, celebrating this Community Mental Health Act without her. I mean, she was the, the force behind it. Um, but first of all, I, I, I think we have to say just how extraordinary it was that 50 years ago that, that uh, a president of the United States made mental retardation, mental illness, uh, a, a, a important national priority that he did this, and he was being pushed by, by his very persistent uh, sister. Uh, uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, she was very close to her older sister, Rosemary. She saw the lack of um, acceptance of disability. She was angered by it. Um, uh, President Kennedy used to joke, he used to say, just give Eunice what she wants, we can get her off the phone, and then we can go back to the business <laughs> of government. Uh, that was like FDR talking to Eleanor. And, 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 she, and she was, she was persistent. But it was more than that, the fact that she had the president's ear. I mean, she was really skilled at, uh, uh, at political strategy, at maneuvering. She, there was a lot of opposition to, to this. Um, she, there was opposition in Congress, the Bureau of the Budget, uh, from the Cabinet, from the NIH, and she thought big. She brought together experts. Uh, uh, she brought together uh, people like Bob Cook and Gunnar Dibwad and Elizabeth Boggs and listened to the experts, the, listened to the, sort of the people who were on the cutting edge, and she really pushed for this. 
Um, Edward Shorter, who's a professor at the University of uh, Toronto, uh -huh. wrote a book called uh, The Kennedy Family and the, and the Story of Mental Retardation. He says this is where she became an advocate, that she went from a, being a, a socialite and a housewife by really taking this on and doing it very skillfully. It's the Special Olympics comes after that. And uh, I, I did a, got to spend a day with Mrs. Shriver in 2007. I did a profile uh, of her. And she was still going to, the, she was still working every day on this issue. You, she was 85 years old at that point. Um, she was, uh, the day I saw her, she was meeting with Senator Harkin. I followed her around when she did congressional visits. And later that week, she was at a congressional hearing. She met the Secretary of Education. She met with governors. She met with college presidents. And that was a quiet week for her. That's how I got her. Uh, I think the following week, uh, I couldn't interview her the previous week because she was off to China. But 85 years old, and she, she, she uh, was dedicated. And, one, and I think one of the other things, a certain young congressman from Rhode Island, I gave a presentation at a statewide conference. He showed up and actually stayed, and he talked for a while. And afterwards, Patrick came up to me and said, you be sure to tell my aunt that I talked about people with mental retardation. <laughs> <laughs> so he was scared. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the role of individual heroes, yeah. both people of great national fame and others, is to be underlined here. A lot of individuals, every individual can do something. And there have been people in presidential positions, the Kennedys, the Carters, etc. There are also people, look what happened with uh, autism, which was nowhere, and all of a sudden Bob and Suzanne Wright got onto it, and it's a major fo focus of attention yep. right now. Dorothy you, Dix, it goes on. Do you on. think that, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get this last issue, and then we're going to go to the floor. Do you think the number of veterans coming back, who are so celebrated now, but so many of them are disabled, and you have something like the Mission Continues or Wounded Warriors uh, that really works for these people. They're getting back up on their feet and are going out to work again. Do you think they're going to help change the face of this uh, issue as well? Yes. There's a lot of concern, and there should be, for veterans come out. The numbers of people coming back are in the hundreds of thousands with post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. The suicides are high. You're right. This is a big additional issue in this regard. Yeah, but it just seems to me, it could, just as World War II, and, and uh, you were saying how, but how much of a difference that made and sort of our understanding and sort of what, what goes on with people. It humanizes it in ways that it, it, it takes the stigma out of it. I, I think it's undoubtedly will be positive in that regard. But what, what World War II did was it changed the way we thought about treatment. And I think unless we have more effective technology for treatment for the, those so-called invisible wounds of more recent wars, that we're going to be hung up with a greater degree of sentiment and positive feeling, but left at sea without more effective treatment. I'm just reminded that the cycles of reform had to be repeated because the technology of early treatment that promised to remove disability didn't really eventuate. I, I'm hoping that our new efforts in early intervention and in, in a variety of illnesses showing more promise now than they did 50 years ago will, uh, will give us a new day and that that will be applied to these returning veterans. But I think we do have to attend to improving treatment and moving that ball forward. We've focused an awful lot on services and how we pay for them. But it's important to focus on the content both of acute treatment and improving our rehabilitative services. These long-term care and support services are outside, for the most part, of the Affordable Care Act. So it, we, we need further investment in that area. It sounds like we need further investments in, in medical schools. You're going to need more docs, aren't you, to be able to deal with them? You're going to need more doctors, but you're going to need more people of all disciplines. Yes. You're not going to be handled by doctors alone. Yes. Uh, I but I'd say one positive note, since Howard and I have been seesawing on positive, negative. I'm somewhat more optimistic about some of the efforts I see around the country focusing on ways to move forward. And that's being done in communities all over the country. There are various kinds of pilot projects launched. People are focusing on how do we make treatment better. He's right. But I think there is some evidence, a movement toward that. Yeah, we, I want what to make we need it clear. is help. What we need is a federal effort. And the, the institute called the National Institute of Mental Health, which was launched in the, in the, uh, yeah. against that World War II uh, problem, is one which should have much more support for research and education on psychiatric illness. Yeah, but it does come back to this issue that <clears throat> frequently a state like Maryland could be a model that you can move the federal effort once you understand what can be done. 
I mean, it's striking the public health advances in New York City that during the Bloomberg years, life expectancy has gone up by three years. That's unbelievable in, yeah. in, a big, in the biggest city in the country. Well, there's a very interesting experiment going out in Washington uh, yeah. run by a, a psychiatrist named Jürgen Unitzer in which he's organized a, wide, a statewide program of attention to psychiatric depression using all kinds of other professionals and have psychiatric involvement that apparently is being very effective. People are looking at that program. That's one that we might replicate. Hmm. It's interesting. Why don't we open this up? It, uh, I, I must confess with the lights here, it's very, very hard thing. to see. But if there, are, there is a microphone that is floating around here that staff has. So if you, we, we would love your um, participation. And uh, we, we, I think we can hear you even if we can't see you, okay? That, yes, sir, please. Hi, Kevin Martone with uh, Technical Assistance Collaborative here in Boston. Um, thank you for the panel. And I just wanted to see from many of the panel members, any of your foresights. Um, you know, when I, over the years, when I talk to people with a serious mental illness, I mean, you know, set aside we don't have a cure for mental illness right now. You know, they can cope with the voices in their head, for example, okay? But it's the poverty, the unemployment, the lack of affordable housing, the fact that they're going to die 25 years sooner than in, than in general public, than you and I. You know, it's those things in their life that really keep, keep them from achieving recovery and really integrating into mainstream society. And I just want to know if anybody had any thoughts as we're thinking about what the next generation of, you know, mental health and addiction services looks like. You know, what does that look like? What's that bold change and what's the incremental change to get there? Thank That's you. right on target. First of all, housing for people with serious mental illness is a very big issue, and you have to have a focus on housing policy along with that. There are also a program now of medical homes which are designed to uh, address the, uh, the additional issues as you're describing beyond the mental illness itself for people who have psychiatric illness. So you're absolutely right. It had, has to be intended. Uh, it has to be attended to. And I think there are some efforts to do more about it. And I think if you look at our biggest failure for people with developmental disabilities, most people are unemployed. Most adults. I've seen figures ranging from 65 to 85 percent. And the one thing in American society that gets you respect and inclusion is having a job. And so the one thing that's the most important to be a valued member of society, people don't have. And how would you address that? Oh, it's got to start at school. It's got to start with schools. For we, while we have great laws, it's one of those implementation issues. They're poorly implemented. We've got to start training people. And on the other side, we've got to start increasing the demand. Some major employers, you know, we hold up Walgreens and Target and few others as being really good at employing people with disabilities. So it's got to be both a supply side solution and a demand side solution. I know we're going to, going to be talking about that a bit later in the day. I saw Bob Drake here and I think he's on one of our panels. Uh, Bob and Debbie Becker and Gary Bond have, have uh, developed a model of individualized placement and support, supported employment services. They're very good at promoting uh, social inclusion. There's a lot of experimental evidence that it's superior to treatment as usual. And one of the connections up to our financing system is that the Affordable Care Act now gives states the opportunity to amend their state Medicaid plans to include supported employment as a home and community-based service in a way that hadn't been available before the act. So I look forward to seeing that propagated. That's an, it's most important to pr uh, promote social inclusion. People want to work. It gives them an identity as a citizen. Uh, remains to be seen just whether it can take people off the disability rolls. That, the evidence there is much, much weaker. But in terms of social inclusion, we have many studies that demonstrate that. I think many of us are very hopeful in that regard. But that doesn't get to Kevin's point about the, the broader welfare of the population. We have a long way to go as a society, I think, in promoting that kind of um, support in all of our communities for people with a wide range of disabilities. That's a place where I think, a, as they say, a rising tide should lift all boats. But there has been an important role, as we saw with the Community Mental Health Centers and Mental, Mental Retardation Act in 63, that there's a place for exceptionalist, specialized, focused legislation as well. So a combination of letting that rising tide lift all the boats and attending to places where special attention is needed that sort of characterizes this period. And I suspect it will characterize the period going forward. Yes, please. Do you, I think there, can the microphone come to you? Where is it?
One of the threads that I hear coming from the panel is this notion that people with mental health conditions and also people with um, the neuro difference of um, intellectual, I would say differently abled people, um, are a cost to society rather than generators of income. And I, I think this is where we can make a difference and particularly the people that are in the media can make a difference because we know that this isn't true. Uh, many of us are in this room today because of the success of World War II, one of the leaders of whom was uh, Winston Churchill. We now know he lived with bipolar disorder, depression. He was very out about that um, in his writings. Uh, when, uh, of course, Abraham Lincoln and our very own Dr. Craig Ventner, the genome maverick who has bipolar II. And we don't hear enough about this. And so there is, again, this mistaken notion that we are taking away, we cost money, people have to support us, and like all people, we can be ill at times. We get the flu, people need to be taken care of. But I think we need to really be generating the conversation from the half full point of view that we're actually generating income and contributing to GDP in major ways. You know, that, 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 that's a terribly critical point, and you can, uh, Think of the Mental Health Centers Act of 63 as doing a lot of things. But I think one of the things it said is, hey, we've got a lot of people here who are functioning pe members of the society, can be there. Let's take another look at the notion of pessimism or nihilism regarding what they can do. And that's had an enormous record. We have all kinds of people with all kinds of psychiatric problems who are out there functioning like people with any other kind of medical, medical problem. I think the point is extremely point, important. Right? Yeah, that, that was partly my point, but there's a semantic issue that I wanted to address all morning and even last night. Um, when I talked about the wide range of people that are in these prevalence figures, we don't talk about the mentally ill. That, that is, I mean, it's not just semantic and a, a matter of respect. It, it, it disguises what is accurately true. We don't talk about the physically ill in contrast. People have conditions and so there's a wide range and it's misleading. When, when the federal parity law was passed, the headline writers said better insurance benefits for the mentally ill. And I wrote that, it was in the Washington Post, I wrote a letter to the editor. I said the coverage was improved for all of us. It wasn't special pleading on behalf of some definable group of individuals. It was coverage for all of us because any one of us in the course of a year might be a service user. We need that coverage and it has to be the same as the coverage for other conditions. So even our language needs to improve in response to the very important point you're making. Can you help us with the language? If you've been talking to the headline writer, <clears throat> what would you advise that person? We, the convention in journalism today is to ref, is called person first language, and we say people with a disability. Or, I don't even use the term now that I'm approaching becoming a member of the class, the elderly. <laughs> I, I mean, that term has special offense to me. Yeah. You know, you and I, you. David, we're, you know, we're people who are aging. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> you know, Gracefully. You know, Dave, you can take from that point, when you go back to the numbers, the number of people who may need some kind of help at one point or another from a psychiatric or mentally health point of view is enormous in this country. 60 million people with all kinds of families are also impacted by them. And one of the biggest problems is the stigma which makes people reluctant yeah. to acknowledge that. So we point out people who come up and are brave enough or courageous enough or helpful enough to say something, but just imagine how many people are out there with some kind of problem who at some point need some kind of psychiatric help or yeah. mental health help. Yeah. But your point, ma'am, is well taken. Thank you. Thank you. There are, there are other hands coming up. Yeah, um, but we could never see them, believe me. This is, is there a, you have a microphone, too. I do. Good. <laughs> so I'm grabbing it. Uh, this is, I'm Becky Vaughn. I'm with the State Associations of Addiction Services. And I want to make sure we don't lose sight of addiction in terms of the people who are dealing with substance use disorders. Um, we have a penetration of 1 in 10, as it was said last night. 
that would not be tolerated in any other health, and yet we have millions of people in recovery. And I'm kind of going back to <laughs> what you had said earlier in terms of the funding for this. Uh, we're still hitchhiking. We can't afford a plane. Um, and that is a serious, serious issue in terms of how we're going to make sure people can access treatment, even with parity laws and ACA in terms of capacity and getting the help they need. This is an incredibly important thing, and yet we're still suffering with wild, widely um, abused stigma in terms of it not being accepted as the chronic disease that it is. No, no disagreement there, <laughs> but it is useful, again, to point out the progress. The 96 parity law excluded treatment of substance use disorders, whereas the 2008 law made it explicitly included, and our new term of behavioral health is a way of being sure. more encompassing. But we still have a long way to go. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, I think we're getting close to closing, and I have something I, I want to say. I mean, it's... It's tragic that, that this piece of legislation that's brought us all together was the last piece of legislation that President Kennedy signed before he was tragically assassinated. And many of us were devastated by that generally, but specifically for, because of interest in this area. But right behind in Johnson's Great Society came Medicare and Medicaid, and as my colleagues who are both here, Richard Frank and Sherry Gleed, told us in their wonderful book, Better But Not Well, that these mainstream programs have also moved us <clears throat> along in a very positive way. I think we all want to focus on both these broad, big picture items as well as these mainstream programs to get us where we want to go. Are there any other <clears throat> final words? We are closing. Yes, I just please. make one other point, and I think... Picking up on the, the point about uh, substance abuse, what's been recognized is that comorbidity, by which I mean that people having two conditions, let's say mental illness and substance abuse, mental illness and some kind of non-mental uh, problem, right. are some of the biggest cost drivers in the system. So the economists have attended to this, which causes additional incentive for us to try to figure out how to make better programs for those people. Mm -hmm. Joe? Uh, I think I just would close by saying just how, uh, again, how extraordinary it was that President Kennedy in 1963 was talking about uh, uh, understaffed, overcrowded, unpleasant institutions. That he, that he, th this was, 1963, this was long before the exposés that were, were going to come looking at institutions. Uh, Burton Blatt, Christmas and Purgatory is 1965, uh, 66, uh, Tidicott Follies is 67. Uh, Robert Kennedy goes to Willowbrook in 1965. This is 1963. There had been one, one other uh, expose before that, and, and was, Dr. Goldman was talking about how close this, we were to World War II. Um, conscientious objectors from World War II served in institutions, and at the end of that like time, they, were, they, were, they knew it was time to leave, and they, were, they wanted to document what was going on. People sneaked cameras in, took pictures. They uh, ran in Life magazine of these horrible conditions, Americans had just seen the pictures. It reminded them of what they'd seen of the concentration camps. They were shocked by these pictures of, of uh, naked uh, men on wards, uh, gaunt, underfed. Um, so there was this um, uh, humanism, this, this human rights push after World War II that made us prepared for, for this. But in 1963, John Kennedy was far ahead of his time. Good. Right. And, and I would add the same thing. You know, extraordinary promise in 1963. And in some places, in limited, in limited amounts, we're fulfilling that promise. But for most people with developmental disabilities, we have a very long way to go. And it, what's, it's what gets me up in the morning. Well, I know it's particularly apt that uh, we have this 50th anniversary. Uh, we have a forum here to celebrate it. And, um, but there is also a feeling that this could be a new milestone. We're opening up a new chapter that could be very, very promising. We'll see. But in the meantime, I want to thank all of you for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't go on. But... There's going to be a full day here, uh, an opportunity to ask questions for a, lot, a long time. Uh, so I want to give a, a please join me in uh, thanking our panel and uh, Howard and Herb, Joe, and uh, now here we are. Hey, Patrick, how are you? Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, thanks for inviting me. Sorry. Uh, so I want to thank everybody. Weren't they just fantastic? Fantastic. Thanks for your leadership. Thank you, David. Uh, so there, the next uh, sessions are downstairs, the two breakout sessions. Uh, also, we'd like to get many of you on camera throughout the day. We're going to take uh, snippets of what all of you say and try to incorporate it into these tremendous panels. Um, right to the big issue that Howard talked about, their big ideas and then their small incremental progress. As I said last night, we need to have oversight on the implementation of parity. So I want all of you to think as we have all these panels about how do we measure progress. And one of the things that we absolutely all need to be on the same sheet of music about is public disclosure of both the federal government and the insurance companies in the way these decisions to afford care to some and some conditions and some service areas versus others, that that needs to be transparent or else we're going to be out of the game altogether because we won't know how to whether we're being treated equally to cancer, to diabetes, to cardiovascular disease. So the calling card for all of us is public disclosure and transparency as a requirement with, from insurance companies. But I, because this is about my uncle, and he's not just my uncle, I wanted to introduce another champion for advocacy, and that is my cousin Christopher Lawford. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you all. Thank you all. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you all for coming. I didn't know Patrick had so many really good friends that would show up here. Um, I, unlike Patrick, who ran for Congress when he was never intended on becoming an advocate. I wrote a book a little while back uh, detailing my descent into drug addiction and my eventual recovery. I've been clean and sober 27 years. Two things happened when I wrote that book. Thank you. Uh, one, my family got really nervous. And two, among the people that I wasn't related to, that book did really well. And I haven't, sh being a good addict, I haven't shut up since. Um, to me, this is, this is my issue, um, uh, addiction. And as, as most of you know, there's comorbidity all over the place, uh, 50 to 70 percent, depending on who you talk to. Uh, this has been an issue that's been important to me ever since I was young. Um, I, you know, I remember uh, my uncle very well. I remember the mental health, uh, the Community Mental Health Act of 1963. I used to work for my my aunt Eunice uh, with for with people with intellectual disabilities. And I'm glad to see that this this movement now has encompassed addiction. We're all in this together. Um, I commend Patrick for doing this. Um, it's time for our community to, to hold society accountable. As Patrick says, this is the civil rights struggle of our era. It is time for us. We can no longer be treated separately and unequally. So thank you for your attention and thank you for your, uh, for your work. Thank you all. Let's go on the next panels. Thank you so much.